Hello everyone, my name is Taylor Swamberg and I'm a master's student at Acadia University, currently supervised by Dr. Laura Ferguson, Dr. Kirk Hillier, and Dr. Russell Easy. And today I'll be presenting my poster, Detecting the Spread of Invasive Mosquitoes and Disease Potential in Nova Scotia, also known as Mi'kma'ki. So I just want to go into a bit of background information before I get into the nitty gritty of my research. So as we know, climate change is continuing to alter our environment, specifically through the increasing of temperature. And as mosquitoes are ectothermic um, animals, which means their internal temperature is dependent on their external temperature, with this increased temperature, we're likely to see expanded ranges in many mosquito species. So not only are we going to see expanded ranges, we were likely to see invasive species start to arrive in Nova Scotia. Uh, species such as Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are extremely medical important as they're vectors of chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika virus, and we currently do not have them here in Nova Scotia to our knowledge. They were recently detected in Ontario in 2016, and as you can see with this infographic here, we're actually likely to see Aedes aegypti established in Nova Scotia by the year 2050 due entirely on the increase in temperature due to climate change. So for Nova Scotia, to really say that this species is not here yet, we really can't deduce that because there's been over 20 years since the last survey of mosquito species in Nova Scotia. This was done in 2021 and 27 species known to Nova Scotia were detected. As recently as 2007, Aedes japonicus, also known as the Asian bush mosquito, was detected in Nova Scotia, particularly in containers such as discarded tires around Annapolis Valley and Halifax. So with these introduced mosquito species carrying the potential to vector these diseases to Nova Scotians, we also have local diseases that are transmitted from the species that we currently have. So these include West Nile virus and Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus. So because of climate change and the ability of these invasive mosquitoes to arrive, the key thing here is detection. So these mosquitoes may be able to arrive and proliferate within our population without detection. So to protect our population, we really need to create a method of not only surveillance, but particularly surveillance of these invasive species. Another way of surveillance that's currently being used in the molecular world is called eDNA or environmental DNA. So because animals live in their environment, such as in the air, in the ground, or in the water, they can shed their cells and their DNA within this environment. So by collecting water or part of the environment, we can actually detect these animals using traces of their DNA without the need of collecting the specimens themselves. So to emphasize why I'm doing this project, I want to show you that mosquito-borne disease pose an increasing risk as climate change reshapes the province's natural environment into one that enables the establishment and spread of invasive vectors of disease. So we know that we're coming and we need to be able to detect them. So my study aims to assess the mosquito species currently established through Nova Scotia, including population composition and range, determine what ecological factors impact the presence and spread of mosquito species within the province, and thirdly, to evaluate if eDNA or environment, environmental DNA detection is an accurate enough method to replace more labor-intensive mosquito sampling, such as the traditional sampling that I'm also using in my project. So I collected mosquitoes in 2021 and 2022 from May to October, and I collected larvae at over 232 sites at various water um, classifications. As you see here, we have containers, ephemeral pools, permanent ponds, roadside ditches, and wetlands. I also want to spread my larval sampling across all ecozones of Nova Scotia. So all varying sites of the province that are different based on elevation, precipitation, as well as the average daily temperatures and uh, yearly temperatures. I also collected adults throughout the province, and I did this using CDC traps at 40 different sites, as well as I collected adults that landed on me while I was sampling at these larval sites. So as you can see in this infographic here, the CDC light trap, that's how I generally collected adult mosquitoes, the dipper on the right, that's how I generally collected larval mosquitoes, and I also additionally collected water. So what I mean by I collected water is I collected water to see if there was DNA for this mosquito species within the water, and I want to compare if this is actually accurate enough to replace traditional dipper sampling. So to give you a bit of a breakdown of what I did and how I did it, you can see on number one, I collected a sample from a potential mosquito habitat. So basically I just collected water and preserved it within ethanol and kept it frozen. 
And once I had it back to the lab, I spun it down in a centrifuge and extracted all the DNA within that sample. And once I had this DNA, I could run it with a barcode region primer, which amplified a region of the genome that's very specific to different species. And I can actually send this part of the genome of all the different DNA within my sample to be sequenced and actually find multiple species. In particular, I'm looking for mosquito species here. So the nice thing about this method of detection is it can be used um, in many different remote areas of the province, as well as you can employ many different people, as well as citizens and community science to collect these water samples, which is also something I initiated in my project as well. And just to go over a few of the results that I've done so far. So in 2021, I collected over 4,500 mosquitoes and I identified 30 species, so actually three new species from the previous surveillance in 2001. So almost 2,000 mosquitoes from CDC traps, just under 2,000 mosquitoes from dipping, and about 800 from landing adults that I collected while I was at the larval sites. So the three new species that I found for the province are here on this map also with my larval sampling sites and my CDC sites. So I can show you a bit of a representation of where I've collected them. So CS Minnesota is also Culoceta Minnesota, which is originally from Eastern USA, and it's not a known vector of any serious diseases. And that was caught in Annapolis Valley and Halifax, mostly in roadside ditches. Next, I found a species Culex selenarius, which is predicted to have been in Nova Scotia, but we still didn't find it in 2001. So this species is originally from the eastern United States and is a known vector of West Nile virus and triple E or Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus. And the third species that I found for the first time was Culoceta melanera. So this is originally from the eastern United States as well and it's a vector of West Nile virus and triple E. And I really want to point out that this is the most important vector of triple E in the USA. So the most important vector species are transmitting this disease between birds and humans. So it's really actually quite serious that we've detected it here. And as you can see, I found this in Annapolis Valley, Halifax, and Truro. And I actually mainly found these in permanent ponds, such as bogs. I also divided many of my species based on which habitats they were found in and how many species I found in each type of habitat to look at the general diversity. So as you can see in the first infographic here, I divided many of these important vector species based on which habitats I found them in. So Aedes japonicus, that invasive species that was first detected in 2001, was found mostly in tires, whereas a species like Anopheles punctipennis was found mostly in roadside ditches and permanent ponds, so more natural containers. And here you can see on the right side the habitat classification. So here I divided how many species are found in each different type of habitat. And as you can see, although wetlands and ephemeral pools, which are more natural habitats for, in our environment, had the most species diversity, containers had every species that was found was a known vector of either West Nile virus or Triple E, which really shows that these containers can be a really important hotspot for disease to proliferate within the population. And the other interesting point that I observed was the expansion of Aedes japonicus. So as I said, the first detection was in 2007, where it was found in just three counties. And during my surveillance in 2021, I actually found it in every single county of Nova Scotia. And actually while sampling tires, it was the number one species I found. So if you're out walking about and you see a tire, discard it with some water in it, take a look and by chance, I can guarantee Aedes japonicus are in that tire. It's really shown that the species has expand it throughout the province in such a short amount of time. Another thing I wanted to look at with my species was the seasonality of mosquito genera. So I divided the six different species of genera, we, uh, six different genera of species we have here in Nova Scotia by when they were detected by my traps and by my collection. So this is just for adults. But as you can see, 80 species, which makes us up a majority of our species, was found throughout the year from June to October. And actually this year, I found them as early as May. And other species such as Coclotidia amoeima were really restricted in their seasonal presence. And this also varies throughout the province in different areas and different habitats. So using this, I can kind of create a, a heat map of where disease risk may be most prominent in Nova Scotia, especially when there is these diseases detected within our populations. So just to conclude everything that I've come up with my research is that 
we really need surveillance in Nova Scotia, especially rigorous and early detection as these diseases that may arrive with our invasive mosquitoes may arrive and become undetected. So although I have not received the results from the sequencing of my eDNA samples, I'm excited to see if this is a good enough strategy for future implementation of surveillance, not only in Nova Scotia, but, but throughout many parts of the world where this is needed. Thank you so much for listening. And I want to give special thanks to Acadia University, Research in Nova Scotia and Public Health Agency of Canada for allowing me to do this research.